I can't help but say uh, good evening, comrades, as we are in lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> how's uh how's lockdown going for you guys i'll start with you ribbon <laughs> it's getting, yeah, it's all right like i i won't i've got a job that i can still go to work so it doesn't really affect me too much but um it's getting a little frustrating all the, the changing rules and and whatnot and that's an understatement but i don't really want to go into it too much so <laughs> makes sense makes sense how about you Lachlan? um yeah, not too bad. I think, uh, like Ribs has said, I, I can work from home and I'm fairly comfortable. I think that they're renaming that the uh, the laptop class. Laptop is, class, uh, yeah. That yeah, came from yeah. a um, that came from a speech that I, don't, I forget one of the senators gave uh, yeah. a week or two back. I don't know whether you heard it. It was very interesting. I heard it. Yep, yep. That's the one I forwarded you to you, Tim. Yeah, I saw. Yeah, um, yeah. So look, I, I'm okay. Um, yeah, kids are frustrated. Wife is frustrated, <laughs> but uh, and we're just doing more gardening than usual. So <laughs> that's what's I bet going you're, on. Um, I bet you're super excited to no longer be in a two-bedroom house with all these Heck yeah, man. rules. Absolutely, <laughs> that would be um, yeah, that'd be a whole different world of pain if we're still in the old place. So um, yeah, man. Did you yeah. did you do a Bunnings rush? I did actually. Funnily enough. Um, <laughs> But uh, we'll sort of uh, lead on to something I'll talk about later. But uh... ooh, ooh, I'm intrigued. <laughs> I did a uh, groceries rush first thing Saturday morning, um, trained, and then straight off to do the groceries. And uh, the shops are a weird place at the moment. There's so many things out of stock, and um, then all of a sudden there's thousands of them, and. Mm. Um, th there seems to be a bit of inconsistency around supply chain with some stuff, which is interesting. Well, it, it's actually going to get a lot worse because I don't know if you've seen on the news all the stuff around um, the supply blockage over in China. And they've got one of the um, biggest backlogs of vessels ever waiting to get into a port um, sitting outside of China. So, uh, you know, if you're um, expecting some stuff to come in for Christmas, um, just be careful because... Uh, <laughs> Shop local. <laughs> so, so certain things may be, uh, may be in short supply as, uh, as time gets on. Wow. Mm. Well, um, we're, we're, we're doing lockdown here too. So I took the family for a walk today and um, yeah, many Lego projects getting done. Finished my spaceship, which I was pretty happy about. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, all looking good. Um, my beverage of choice this evening, I've gone for an ale. It's made in Victoria. It's called a Furfy. And uh, I, I like that because it's a funny name for a lie, but it's actually really nice. What are you drinking, Lachlan? Uh I actually got a, a new gin in that I'm um, having a go of. Uh, this is a Japanese one by the name of uh, Aiki, which uh, comes from Okinawa. And uh, it's got a pretty unique flavor profile on it actually it's, it's interesting complex lots of stuff going on in it so it's um yeah not bad Don't i was lie. actually looking at that online just a couple of days ago i was very okay. tempted very tempted so yeah it's, is, it's is it similar, worth getting? I, there's another one i really like called uh the botanist and it, it's got a a similarly sort of like a bit more edgy flavor profile to the the standard london dry gin sort of things so that's yeah, it's not bad Hmm. Rubes, what are you destroying there in your glass or cup or whatever you've got? I don't want to say. Oh. I know, you already, you already, like, it's the same as you. <laughs> you drinking <laughs> a first now, I, now I just sound like a hack. Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> we need to coordinate this better. <laughs> well, you know, last week, uh, Kim and I both had wine, so, you know. It's, yeah, it works. But it works. wasn't the yeah. same wine. It no, wasn't the it same wasn't. wine. <laughs> no, no, I actually, I thought I'd give it a go because uh, Tim's been banging on about it. Um, and it's it's good. I like it. It's solid, man. It. For a mainstream yeah, right. ale, it is good. I'm going to have some more, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Just before we start, Lachlan, hmm. so you're famous now. You're on another podcast uh, through the week. What, what was that podcast? <laughs> Hardly famous. Um, but no, I was a guest on the... Uh, Zen Garage uh, podcast um, hosted by Justin Fox. So this kind of a 
uh, Sydney car scene guy who's been around for yonks and um, he used to organise a lot of big car meets and all that sort of thing in, in Sydney. So, uh, no, we just got together and just yacked about cars, shockingly, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, just talked about some of the, the stuff I've got and I guess just uh, how I want to kind of uh, drive and experience all kinds of weird and wacky contraptions and the stranger the better. Mm. I have a, a thirst for the unusual. So, uh, you know, hence my key car that I have at the moment, but I'm sure there'll be all sorts of oddities to come sometime in the future. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, no, it was loads of fun. Um, it, he's a great guy and it's an easy, easy chat. So if um, anyone is sort of uh, automotive inclined, feel free to go check out the Zen Garage podcast. It's not a bad thing. Yeah, I, I, I enjoyed it. I'm, I'm uh, well into the episode that you're on, and um, yeah, it was good, well produced, and as you say, easy to listen to. Seems like a nice guy. Um, mm. I I know Lachlan before lockdown started. It felt like every weekend you were at some car meet or something, <laughs> taking photos and drinking coffee. Doing yeah, well, I guess it's sort of um, become a bit of a, a ritual. To, to try and squeeze something in at some point over the weekend. I don't get to do it every weekend, but, you know, I, I just try and, um, even if it's just a duck out, have a quick drive or something. But, I mean, pre-lockdown, and there, there's so much stuff on, really, to be honest. Um, we've got a pretty amazing car scene in Sydney, and um, I don't know, I'm into everything. So you can go check out some, you know, American V8s or, you know, rotary meat or you know aussie cars there's all kinds of different sort of stuff going on all the time so yeah if you're looking for something you'll find something that's pretty much the way it goes <laughs> yeah i'll have to go to one with you once we're out of lockdown mm. for sure man all right cool bananas well let's uh let's get into the second half of book two within the republic um this is really you know as as true to form very complicated and deep and Pack full of information and ideas. Um, so where did we leave off last week? So much writing and notes and things in there. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, where did we leave off last week? Well, basically, they restated uh, the case. Didn't Glaucon they? and Adamantus, his brother, went and went back over Thrasymachus's sort of ideas, um, and really sort of rehashed and put a bit of shine on it to, to try and sort of make that argument as, as as clear as it could be, despite the fact that they didn't necessarily agree with that uh, that point of view. But, you know, in the uh, in the guise of continuing the, uh, the, the argument or the debate, they wanted to put forward the strongest case for, um, you know, uh, what was it, justice being... Um, more advantageous for the stronger, I think, was kind of the way they put it. But um, or benefits the stronger, yeah. I think, is is, is the turn yeah. of phrase. Yeah. And kind of an ex yeah. as an extension of that, they were saying that uh, injustice is more beneficial than justice. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think one of the final sort of things they were sort of wrapping up on was that, you know, I, I think this was like the bone they were throwing uh, Socrates at the end. There was that, um, you know, maybe it shouldn't be put on the scale and weighed just in a uh, sort of financial or positional sort of sense and that there should be something about, you know, benefit for the soul or something to be considered in the argument. And that and that's kind of where they wrapped it up and sort of said, well, you know, Socrates, how are you gonna, how are you gonna argue against this? You know, convince us that, uh, that the just man is better or it's better to be just. That's right. Hmm. And um, he, yeah, then Socrates kind of kicks off in response to that and typically doesn't answer the question. Um, <laughs> and he then kind of goes into this thing. He's like, well, let's let's talk about what justice is then. And then he immediately kind of turns it, to, talks about two different types of justice. And he's like, there's justice for the as an individual and justice in the larger sense as a society. And then he makes an argument for why they should then start by talking about what it means as a society, which is pretty brief and concise and they all kind of agree to it. So then they go into talking about um, 
what is justice within the context of society. Yeah, I really like the way that they decide to take that tack, though. That the analogy, that analogy, of, yeah, of uh, you know, small words. Yeah, you know, so something like uh, these these little words on the back of my book here being quite difficult to read, but then big words like at the top of the, my page here being easy to read. So you know, rather than thinking about this from the perspective of a single person. You know, is it easier to see it if we look at it in a broader sense through a community or a society? But then they mm. take this really weird turn. And um, it, it, I was saying to uh, Ruben before we started uh, tonight's episode that it kind of it made me think that maybe the creator of civilization read this thing because um, it kind of describes how to build a society. And uh, mm. I was like, wow, this sounds like a tutorial to civilization or <laughs> something like that of what you need to build a society. And um, I, I thought that was interesting that they decided to build a fictional one rather than using the one they were in. Um, I agree. I thought that was odd. Their, their response is, okay, well, let's talk about what, and let's decide what an ideal society is from the couches that we're sitting on while we sip our wine. I, it's, to me, it was a bit of an odd, um, like an odd decision, the way to tackle it. What did you think? It, it was odd, but, you know, in some sense, it, it was actually quite informative because you can definitely see, like, you know, uh, Socrates has a particular vision for what life should be. And obviously, you know, we've, we've discussed before, he's a guy who doesn't have a lot of money. Uh, you know, his mates are always sort of bailing him out as far as, <laughs> like, uh, you know, paying his, his fee or whatever it is. Um, and I think it would seem to me that he's not really interested in money, right? So he's, he's a pretty unusual guy, really, when you think about it in the sort of sense of what their society is, is really sort of working towards. And I think the way he starts to describe how you build the city is how he would build the city, mm. which is, you know, it's, how does he describe it? It's basically that, um, you know, it's, it's born out of necessity so that you effectively you're going to have people that come together that really need to rely on each other to provide the services to support each other to be a successful uh, society so you know if you have a farmer uh, you probably also need a, a tailor to help provide clothes and you might need uh, so another build a, tools a, yeah exactly right and so it's it's all about it's being born out of necessity you need each other to be able to survive yeah, that's right. And they make a decision right there at the start. They have a little sort of discussion mm. and they basically say somebody who does multiple different things, as you would, if you're a farmer and you'd no one to help you, you'd have to make your own clothes, your own tools and your, and your own shoes. And they say, would that person be best at all of those things? Or if he focused on one thing, would he be, uh, would that be the most efficient way to do it? And they make a decision early on that like, yes, if you can concentrate on your one profession then that's the only way that you're going to excel at it um and so they say out, out of that is born the necessity that up, people will have to specialize so there you therefore have to have multiple people to make up this society and i, I thought that was a, a very reasonable way to look at it and it, it, it seems to play out in reality too is the way that we the way we see it i, I think certainly in that era um that would have been absolutely bang on i mean it's not like uh you know, today you might find that people go through um, maybe a few different professions and stuff in their lifetime. Um, but in that time, you know, as soon as you're probably old enough to, you know, get up and get a job or whatever it is, you know, you're going to start in, you know, a, a, a traineeship or, a, you know, apprenticeship or what have you with whatever field it is that you're going to do. And you're probably going to stick at that unless you absolutely suck at it. Um, yeah, I, well, I think, sense, yeah, obviously, I think. obviously automation and the way that we live now changed everything. But yeah, you're right. Back then, that, that it seemed like a pretty reasonable way to characterize it. Yeah, for sure. It actually made me um, reflect because I'm a bit of a dabble at many things sort of guy. And um, while I was reading that, I was like, oh, I wonder what would that be for me? Like if I just chose one thing to do, what would that be? Because I've played in so many places and... Yeah, I've 
failed a few times, but most of the time I managed to fumble my way through whatever it is I'm doing. So I thought, like, wow, like, should is his opinion that that's actually not the best use of my time? Should I be specialising in one thing rather than many things? I, I thought about that for a few minutes and then realised I needed to keep reading. <laughs> <laughs> what's the what's the what's that saying? I wonder if this is where that's they're saying jack of all trades but master of none. I wonder if this is where it came from. Mm. Yeah, it might be. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I mean, that, that sort of comes to bear fruit later on when they discuss further. So um, I think it was good that they sort of landed on that because it just gave them some basis to move forward, I guess. Um, really interesting. I, know, I think this is where the, the Socrates is sort of bit sort of plays out now. They talk about like what kind of society that it's going to be. And Socrates basically describes it's effectively a simple life. Everyone has everything that they need within this society. You know, they're working together, there's enough food for their table, they've got a little bit of wine to sort of enjoy of an evening. Um, you know, they've got shoes for their feet and clothes for the winter. So he's saying like that, no one's doing without, everyone's living comfortably, and this is a good lifestyle. And I, I think this is where his friends, you know, sort of go, well, okay, we can see your ideal society here, maybe, <laughs> but it's probably not really reflecting real life here you know most people want some of life's luxuries and uh i think this is where it starts to go down a different direction maybe than uh <laughs> it's probably exactly how uh, socrates intends it right oh i don't know i'm 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 more and more becoming skeptical of socrates <laughs> <laughs> I, I think he's a fraud yeah <laughs> oh well wow. uh, no, 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 that's a strong, I don't mean that, that's a strong statement, but I, I, I just, I think he's more ass than class, put it that way. Sure. Oh, so you think he's stumbled across greatness rather than intentionally aiming for it? Yeah, which I'm not, I'm not critical, like, he's obviously a smart guy, but I do kind of he's feel like he's just, yeah, no, no I, I do, I do feel like he's just kind of, you know, this knocking around, bouncing around guy, just stumbling across all these things, but um, no, he's interesting. Paid, found some uh, rich dudes to pay for his wine. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> there's, an, there's a real there's a real element of like not fraud, but he's a, like he's a bit of a mooch. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I could just see saying, on his headstone, Socrates, a bit of a mooch. <laughs> <laughs> it could be worse. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So like. I, I think the interesting is as they start to, to go down this sort of pathway about the luxuries, um, the city that they're starting to describe is... Expands. Yeah, it's expanding and it's starting to sound, I think, a little bit more like maybe what you'd think of when you're thinking of a city. So they're saying there's going to be all these other jobs that we're going to need to do um, because, you know, if you want to have, I don't know, uh, you know, marble on your benches, you know, we need to get masons in and we need to get, you know, this, that and the other and... If you want and to have things have you know, to come from overseas, yeah. yeah, 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 and we're gonna have to have traders, we're gonna have to re have retailers, and so there's this whole sort of raft of extra jobs and what have you that they sort of decide that they're gonna need as a society in order to have that kind of level of you know goods or services available to them, and um, I think that's where they sort of start talking about maybe not having enough space for their, what was their small village that's now become this big thriving city. And maybe Tim, this is getting back to your civilization sort of stuff again, because um, mm -hmm. he sort of comes up with a, a pretty solid quote at this point in time, which I'll, I'll just read out. Um, and a slice of our neighbor's land will be wanted by us for pasture and tillage. And they will want a slice of ours if, like ourselves, they exceed the limits of necessity and give themselves up to that unlimited accumulation of wealth. That, Socrates, will be inevitable. And so shall we go to war, Glaucon? Shall we not? Most certainly, he replied. And without <laughs> determining as yet whether war does good or harm, thus much we may affirm that now we have discovered war to be derived from causes which are also the causes of almost all the evils in states, private as well as public. Undoubtedly, says Glaucon. Oh, you're right. That. It's yeah. pretty poignant. Yeah. So I've written in my book at that point, and I've underlined that very part. Does materialism lead to war? That was mm. the question I wrote there. Um, 
But I think he also... a podcast right there. Yeah, well, that's true. Um, But doesn't he also say somewhere about how, like, going beyond the simple life is problematic? Why is bad for it? I I was trying to find where I read that. I don't remember that bit, if you could find it. Yeah. I just feel like he was saying... uh, Socrates certainly, I I think, uh, when Glaucon sort of brings up that stuff about all of life's luxuries, Socrates, I think... Ah agrees that people would challenge his view on society if they didn't go down that path like if he just sort of held that idyllic little scenario up that uh, it wouldn't stand up to the challenge people would say come on mate you're stacking the deck here you know yeah, what yeah. about reality everyone just, everyone just gets what they need and then that's it and they're yeah. happy it's like yeah. mm, I don't know well, yeah. I think, yeah I think he hints so I'll, I'll read the bit that I was talking about so he goes up oh, now I understand the question which you would have me consider is not only how a state, but how a luxurious state is created. And possibly there is no harm in this, for in such a state we shall be more likely to see how justice and justice, uh, and injustice originate. In my mm. opinion, the true and healthy constitution of the state is the one which I have described. But if you wish also to see a state at fever heat, I have no objection, for I suspect that many will not be satisfied with the simpler way of life. They will be adding for sofas and tables etc etc um so i think at that point like he's basically saying the one i came up with is good it's not going to cause issues but if you want to go beyond that it'll probably show us where injustice is as well (laughs) i I think um he was also kind of talking to the health of the people though um because that was something that uh socrates was like talking about in that sort of simple life you know they're, they're eating good food healthy food and and that's basically leading to a healthy society where they live long lives and they have, you know, healthy children and all this sort of thing. Right. And so I think he's sort of saying, you know, if you're going to that luxurious decadence, um, you know, there's, uh, there's more wine, there's cheese, there's, you know, uh, all this other stuff that's going to lead you to uh, a more unhealthy lifestyle. Cause I, he certainly makes mention of like, Oh, we're going to need uh, physicians. Right. Because, you know, you guys are just going to be unhealthy fat cats who just, you know, you, you're going to be like complaining about gout and all this sort of stuff. So we're going to need to put the leeches on you or whatever it's going to be. So, um, yeah, it's just interesting. Like, uh, you know, Socrates really thinking about, I think, the health of the people as well. It's, int- it's just a something I wouldn't have thought of in that argument, right? Just funny how yeah. that sort of played a part of it. Yeah, so then they, um, I, I thought it was a bit of a weird turn, um, but then they went and, and started to say, well, if, if, if we're fighting over fields and we're fighting over space, then we're going to need soldiers. He refers to them as guardians, but uh, he's, what he's describing, from what I can tell, is essentially soldiers. Um, does um, anyone else hear Destiny music when they read that part about guardians? <laughs> <laughs> I, I straight up like, I'm like, guardians. Okay. <laughs> 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 um yeah so the, the they start i i, I the, the impression i got is it's not just soldiers it's almost kind of like an expanded definition of what we we have military and we have police but i think back then when he says soldiers he's essentially talking about both military police and for an enforcement arm of the government basically so um but what i thought was odd is he basically then straight away says that is basically going to be the most important profession because without it, you lose everything. Well, you, well, yeah. Look, I guess like you can't have the expansion. You can't have. <laughs> he's got the destiny gun out. <laughs> <laughs> For those who are listening, I have a uh, life-size replica of one of the guns from Destiny in my hair right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry for the distraction. I can't yeah. help myself. <laughs> yeah. So, like, he's definitely talking about. I think the. Uh, effectively the army yeah you're right rubes it's going to be like an important part of their strategy in order for that city to to be anything um and again it sort of goes back to the argument that they had before that sort of rule that they established that uh, you know you can't have farmers becoming soldiers when you get attacked on your doorstep um because they're not going to do a very good job of it so um you've got to go back to that whole thing where if you're going to do one job and one profession you need to stick to that one thing so if you're going to be a soldier then you need to be a full-time professional soldier. Uh, yeah, and I think because because they sort of come to this conclusion that it's almost like 
at this point the most important thing to focus on they then go on to talk about well what makes a good soldier mm. Mm. yeah and uh pretty quickly they you know i suppose it's a natural conclusion they start talking about you know um should be strong in fighting spirit because you know uh obviously you need someone who's going to uh fight hard but they're also talking about i think uh that sort of um you can play your destiny music again, Tim, here. Someone who's going to be like uplifting to the troops and really sort of like turn the tides of war and all this sort of thing. So, you know, they, that's sort of what they're looking for. But that brings with it some challenges from a, a personality type from what they uh, they sort of land on. So, uh, yeah, good. Uh, I'm glad you referenced the destiny music again um, because i'm i'm very comfortable with my adjustment to my decision last week that that is the best soundtrack i listened to it through the week (laughs) so i will be listening to it this week too and envisioning this um is this where they move on to the fido analogy like the the puppy dog thing it's sort of the start of it yeah yeah so So, uh, you found this particularly amusing didn't you Ruben? the whole dog analogy yeah, that's right. That's right. Because they, they, they sort of start out by saying, "Well, we need somebody who's, um, you know, somebody who's who, who's aggressive and can take." This is my words, obviously, a bit layman's term. Somebody who's aggressive can take someone down, and then they say, "Yeah, yeah, okay," but you don't want them to be aggressive to their own people. And then I think one of them says, "Yeah, but those two things are contradictory. If you have someone who is good at just taking people out, and that's what they want to do, and that's what they're trained to do." then they they can't also be you know kind and caring for the people that are important and so so socrates goes well those two nature those the nature of those two things are not in conflict and then the guys are like how so and he goes dogs (laughs) yeah (laughs) i I thought it was really funny but But, I mean, I mean, and analogically speaking, he's right though. Like, you get dogs, mm. and they, um, you know, they're aggressive to strangers, but they're very. If you've got a good dog, obviously, they're they're very caring to any any family members. So he's like, so I mean, if a dog can do it, a person can do it, right? I just thought that was a pretty funny conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> but what really, what really cracked me up is, and then he, he took it a little bit further, and he just goes, and he goes, the reason this is is because dogs are philosophers. Yeah, this, this is yeah. where he's really drawing the bow. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, mate. I, I think, Socrates, you might have had uh, one too many sips of the, uh, of the uh, wine. I, I have a of meme for that very sentence. I have a, a meme for that very sentence. I'll, I'll put it in a um, post-edit. But um, for those listening, it's a dog looking at a sunset at the beach. And the subtitle says, when your dog eats your philosophy homework. <laughs> <laughs> that's really good that is good that is good but I mean he does justify it he does a pretty decent job as far as you can for that claim for that particular claim and he goes well I mean a dog hates and attacks people he doesn't know but he doesn't attack people that he does know and philosophy is the love of knowledge so therefore the dog is operating according to to his knowledge therefore a dog is a philosopher that's the simplest way i can put it i I think it was just because he sort of said that uh the dog has the instinct of knowing or not knowing and so his response must be is that you know uh he wants to know you so he is a a lover of learning and wants knowledge he wants to know which is uh what uh, (laughs) philosophy is the 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 Um, love of learning and wisdom (laughs) But the real, yeah, I was going to say the real takeaway from that is it gives you a definition of philosophy. So, I mean, that's that, that, that's probably the real takeaway from that. But I just like it. I'm like, that's dogs true. are philosophers too. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Why not? I, I wrote in my book um, that very thing. Like, oh, definition of philosophy, the love of learning mm-hmm. and the love of wisdom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's extended from that though, because he's saying that the dog then acts on that knowledge too. Hmm. So it's not only the love of learning, but then a lifestyle that is tailored to that knowledge. Um, And that sort of, that's, you can kind of see that's one of his underlying philosophies, uh, Socrates' underlying philosophies, because um, as he's talking about this state, this, 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 you know, um, this ideal state, he's essentially saying, 
um, what he's describing is um, it needs to be, and this will sort of come out later in the chapter where he's, where he's talking about um, it, we need to, as the person that's running the state, you need to control what's happening and what people are learning. So it's this idea that the person that knows um, and acts according to their knowledge is the person who should be running, running the state. It shouldn't just be someone that's just, you know, wants power or whatever. It's somebody who has a love of knowledge. That's the person that's most, that's uh, most qualified to run the state. Hmm. It, it's, I, I, it's interesting also i mean i i think sorry tim you want to go oh i was just going to say i literally wrote the name marcus aurelius next to that bit yeah dude that's, that's a real like, example of what that definition was that's right the philosopher king the, that, and that's what it gets referred like, this is not i don't think it, i don't know whether they use the term philosopher king in the book but that's what i've heard it referred to hmm. um when people talk about the way that socrates thought they refer to it as the philosopher king yeah. And mm. yeah, that's what Marcus Aurelius was. Yeah. Sorry, Lachlan, you you're going to say? No, it's just interesting. I, I think, you know, um, you know, so this sort of landing on this, this quality of this uh, city guardian or soldier, um, you know, and saying that there should be like a dog. So, you know, strong in fighting spirit, but kind to their friends, but, you know, united in philosophy and the pursuit of knowledge and wisdom, which seems interesting because I, I guess like, um, you know, when you think about what a soldier is today, and maybe it's a bit different then, but, you know, soldiers today, you think about it's about following orders, if you know what I mean, like that chain of command and and all of that sort of thing. Whereas this sort of seems to be more about um, being part of that decision-making process and, um, you know, understanding it. But um, I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much into that. Um maybe it's just yeah, a, a different time and they're, they're do, thinking do, more about i suppose maybe the leaders of this of these guardians in some sense i think that's i think that's why i got the impression that he's not just talking about soldiers in a foot soldier but more somebody who would also be Commanders. like a police officer right right um but I, that's i might be reading too much into it as well hmm. well hang on so let me try and restate what you're saying and i might be completely wrong um because i'm tired but we essentially are you trying to talk about that there's an emphasis on doing philosophy as opposed to knowing philosophy is that what you're getting at well i mean it's just interesting because philosophy is about um challenging and seeking knowledge and in some senses kind of treading your own your own path so you're, you're finding knowledge and information and making decisions and running your life according to that information and knowledge that you've gained right Whereas I think about soldiers, there's more sort of doctrine around following the hierarchy and the instruction that you're given rather than sort of seeking your own knowledge. That's probably not quite right, because I guess when you're in the field, you've still got to seek knowledge according to your training and put it into use. So maybe uh, not being a soldier or something like that myself, uh, maybe I'm not seeing the wood for the trees. I follow what you're saying now. Yeah. Mm. So... um, yeah, like as soldiers, you can't think independently, but he's basically saying that they need to be able to think independently. Well, I think you can think independently, but you can't act independently is, is kind of the difference. Yeah. And I think with the, the doctrine of philosophy, you're supposed to act on that knowledge, as Rubes is sort of saying. So uh, that, that's just where I sort of saw mm, it's an interesting um, difference, I suppose, to maybe the modern modern world. But Yeah, yeah and you've got to remember, too, he's talking about his ideal state. Mm. For sure, well, for sure. So. Well, um, so, talking about ideal states and they start moving on to how they're going to educate these how people. Do you, they're like, all right, so we need these guardians. How are we going to breed these soldiers is essentially where it goes from there. And I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah. an unusual twist, really. I mean, I, I have to admit, I was not expecting this direction. Uh, Wasn't this the was a thing around that time? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that that's not really a a foreign idea. The whole, well, hang on. Let me clarify that. So the the idea of like breeding soldiers isn't necessarily a strange idea at the time. It, uh, maybe not like the breeding of soldiers, but that a philosopher sprouting wisdom. 
um, takes this direction of how we're going to build a box to stop people from having free thought and instead to think what we want them to think. Yeah, oh. that is, yeah, it reeked of that, eh? But that mm. would surely happen. I mean, the Spartans were constantly getting taught not to be afraid and, and the different strategies and um, you know, taught about being strong. Like the, I think the education of soldiers was definitely something that was prevalent. So maybe they're mm. just talking about... Maybe they're trying to identify the right type of education. So it's maybe they, 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 they certainly, certainly are. are, yeah. But yeah. maybe the idea of educating soldiers isn't actually revolutionary or different. It's just they're trying to adjust it. I think, um, look, it, immediately to me it was a bit jarring and it sort of felt um, very foreign. Hmm. Because if you were to say to someone today, oh, um, the government should decide what literature children read because they're in charge of deciding how people should form their worldview or behave um, like morally, uh, it, it seems really wrong. Like it just to us, it seems very foreign. Um, can, can you smell a book burning? <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't smell that foreign to me because of like curriculums. And I know curriculums are but, educational yeah. in a way, but there's definitely curriculums. We have censorship, you know, which has gotten looser since I was a kid, for sure. Um, but you know, th those things are there. Um, and I, obviously, my religious background is Church of England, and um, you know, Church of England, like it was <laughs> the religion by the by the king, you know. And um, they, they certainly were teaching people what to think. And I, I think that's a claim that yeah, atheists throw all over the place all the time towards Christians is, you know, the whole teaching kids things. And that's not just a criticism I, of Christians, but of any religion, I would say. Yeah, but it's different. I think if you're talking about um, like religion in its, in its pure sense, right. And then you're talking about the government and them controlling, because like, I, I guess it depends too on whether you're separating um, state and religion though, as well. And I guess, I don't know, uh, was ancient Greece a religious state? I, I suppose it was in a sense. Um, well, they had this lots of freedom around how you participate in that because there's so many gods and, mm. you know, all this sort of thing. But um, I think I get what you guys are getting at. So this is more of an example of like a North Korea situation um, than, than just uh, setting some criteria and setting some agreed that, well, on rules well i think he, they, they start out he starts out by saying like okay what shapes the mind of a young person and they're like well oh, what do they call it um it, anyway essentially he's referring to literature hmm. um and and stories the music for the soul now, he called it yeah that's right and, and but i think we all agree that there are certain stories that we want children to to read and there's certain ones that we don't. I think everyone agrees on that. I think everyone agrees that the reason for that is that stories at a young age do shape the mind. Um, mm. I mean, do we all sort of agree that that is the case? Like, I think that's certainly true. Yeah. I, I what about do. you, Timmy? You, yeah. So, yeah. so that's their starting off point. Um, I think what, for me, where it got a bit weird is when he then went on to talk about. Um, what is and isn't acceptable to my to our sensibilities now he's he gets pretty heavy-handed absolutely yeah because it's it's essentially he he puts a law in they agree that they're going to put a law in place that you cannot discuss it you cannot write about it you cannot make music about it you know that's right and then he starts is, talking about they, they they start talking about the classics like homer um, and he even says, sure. I, I love Homer. And he's like, mm. but we need to censor this stuff. We need to cut these sections out because because we don't want them to shape the mind in this way or that way. Yeah, he it, basically sort of says that really we only want to tell virtuous stories and that if there's no virtue to it, then we shouldn't be basically sort of saying it. So all others should be censored, including those told about the gods because they get engaged in lots of 
you know, <laughs> poor behaviour and uh, non-virtuous <laughs> activity at various times. Yeah, um, totally fair. <laughs> and he does give one sort of... It was funny. Um, he did give one sort of thing where, like caveat, I guess, where he was sort of saying, well, you could still talk about some of those, but just at specific festivals where you're doing like some ritual sacrifice and only in small groups, like it's almost like it's secret society secret who can know esoteric true, knowledge, you know, uh, you know, meaning or story or whatever it may well be. And that there'll be something done with some, you know, uh, you know, back, back sort of group. But the main thing is that they don't want these other stories to, you know, have the wrong morality implanted on their kids. Well, these future soldiers, um, because they don't want it to be misunderstood by a young and faultless person. I think it's uh, yeah. saying that therefore I... it is most important that the tales which the young first hear should be models of virtuous thoughts. Was I, th- I think the reason, I think part of the reason he goes here though, is that that's one of the things that Adamantius brings up earlier on when they're talking about um, justice and the gods. Because he remember earlier yeah. on he, he goes, uh, well, I mean, the gods behave in such a way and they can be bought off. And there's two possibilities. Either they don't exist and it doesn't matter or they do exist and you can pay them off and they have mm. some pretty shitty behavior. So um, I, I, I think that's the reason he goes here and, and he kind of um, and, and starts talking about it because I think he's trying to address that point. And what's interesting, and, and this is where I think he starts doing theology, which kind of blindsided me how he got there but at this point he's sort of talking about theology but what's interesting is he basically comes out and says yeah yeah all that stuff is lies that can't be true that can't be true of the gods yeah which is a i think it's a very like it's a pretty bold statement and i I don't know contextually whether that would have been like a really bold statement for the time but the other two dudes with him like yeah you're right totally radical for the time yeah absolutely yeah yeah do you um do you remember that bit too yeah, I do. Isn't it one of the charges put against him? In the, in I think eventually, trial? yeah. 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 Because uh, he's essentially a, saying a, that if God exists, a, it's like, it has to be, it's, he's almost saying like monotheistic. Yep. And he really does almost describe the, the, the Christian sense of a, of what God is, which is really interesting. Mm. Um, yeah. 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 I, I think so too. I think that's really interesting. Um, did anyone take any notes on that bit? Because it was interesting how he got there. It was I something did. to do with. Um, I, I've got a. Is going. Um, Sorry, uh, hold, I'll, God, I'll be back in a sec. Keep good. going. I'll just be back in a sec. Keep going. Yep. Um, then God, if he be good, is not the author of all things, as they may assert, but he is the cause of a few things only, and not of most things that occur to men. For few things uh, are the good of human life, and many are the evils. And the good is to be attributed to God alone of the evils, the causes that are to be sought elsewhere, not in him. So they're basically saying, you know, God can only do good things and shouldn't be ascribed as being involved in any of those sort of behaviours and whatnot that we read about in the current sort of literature that we have. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, that's, I mean, we, we said it's the Christian God, but I, I would, also say like it's the Hebrewic Judeo God sure you know? um, and uh, that that's essentially how it God's described in, in the Torah and in the Bible is and, and that the evil has come from elsewhere so um, we're just saying Reuben about so Lachlan just read out um, around God being only capable of good and unchangeable that sort of stuff and i was just saying it's oh that's it's, right it's and a, he, the he same can't, description he in can't, genesis essentially he can't be attributed the creation of evil mm. that's right they're saying that evils the act comes from the actions of man not from god um and god can you can only attribute the the good deeds to um yeah that's which you know and it, that is it's like, quite a conflict that's a, with their current law and you yeah. know uh religious that's sort a of big, Basically. Yeah, that's a there's a big deal, and that 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 mm. very point gets argued for like hundreds of years, even after the coming of Jesus Christ. Like there are like, um, what are they called? The councils. There's there's like multiple yeah. councils where they're arguing against that idea. It keeps popping back up. So well, Seneca, um, um, Seneca, I can't remember if it was in the Shortness of Life or another book, but Seneca talks about 
how he thinks the myths of all the various gods aren't true um, that he doesn't think there's someone holding up the earth on their back and all these different things and, and, and that it's more likely just one god um, I just can't remember exactly where I read him saying that but I, and th that's, yeah. and that's Aristotle comes several to hundred years conclusion. later yeah it's interesting it's well, interesting Aris how they get there So yeah, he does. He goes. He starts hitting on hitting on theo theology. Yeah. So basically, from that point, then they they, they tend to uh, agree that this this is for the good of the people, right? So and another quote they've got: uh, uh, "Let this then be one of our rules and principles concerning the gods, to which our poets and reciters will be expected to conform: that God is not the author of all things, but of good only." So that's a principle they land on for their society that they that they're imagining yeah yeah he takes a really strong position on that like he goes on to say i didn't write down the quote but i wrote in like a, a summary of it that he basically says that a state that operates with the conception of gods that do easy evil is suicidal mm. Mm. so he's like he basically says if a if a state operates off the premise that the gods or god is also the creator of evil um is going to destroy itself which is a really strong position for the time as well yeah, and I mean, look, they they state a bunch of different sort of texts where it, where they sort of show some stories where it's really, I think, showing the the parity between men and their vision of the gods at the time, which is, you know, the gods are fallible, and I think that sort of goes back to a discussion that we're having in one of the previous books there, where they're, they're sort of saying that the the leadership should be infallible, right? And this is kind of setting up that same kind of thing you know if, if gods if the gods are the ultimate leader then they can't be fallible either right yeah that's right and then um they so he goes into talking about and i don't know if we mentioned it on the podcast but you mentioned it to me the other week tim this is where that thing about the noble lie comes out mm. where he says it's impossible for the gods to lie lies are something for men uh, and then they list yeah. some possibilities of when it's appropriate for um for uh for people to lie yeah yeah now i accidentally read a little bit ahead so let me know if i'm hitting on something that you guys didn't read but he says about he says that basic he basically says that if anyone can lie it's the state but if anyone lies to the state there's got to be laws against that it's unacceptable <laughs> but the only people that can lie is the state so is that in the section that you guys read i i didn't read that. that bit but th they certainly sort of uh the bit that i'd read up to uh, up, up to the end of book two was more or less that they agree that, um, you know, no one should be tricked by a lie and that um, it's the most hated thing amongst God and men. And, um, you know, really, despite those scenarios they go through, there is no scenario in which God would lie. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's what they agree on at the end. So like this is, uh, you agree with me then? And I said that this is the second type of form in which we should write and speak about divine things. The gods are not magicians who transform themselves and neither do they deceive mankind in any way. So yeah, that's there, right. There was a whole bunch of stuff about, about shape-shifting and tricks. Because that's in and, all of the stories, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. And they come to the conclusion that there's no excuse for a god to do that. Like, there's no reason for it. They wouldn't do it. No, no. And Zeus definitely does that in those stories. It does the old fly oh, there's, into, there's a ton of... Fly mm, in and yeah. knock up his enemy's wife and all that sort of nonsense that he got up to. It was pretty bad. <laughs> there's even a really funny bit where they're criticizing some of those stories and he's like, oh, and there's that night where Zeus had plans to do something, but then he saw whatever, what's the, the chick's name? Whatever, his wife's name. But he was stricken by her beauty and forgot what he was doing. <laughs> and they're like, that's just not something that would happen to a god. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, pretty much where this book wraps up, um, there's one sort of like last uh, paragraph. I'll, I'll just quickly read that and I think that'll kind of wrap it up and we can yeah, wrap perfect. about it from there. Hey? Um, These are the kind of sentiments about the gods which will arouse our anger and he who utters them shall be refused a chorus. Neither shall we allow teachers to make use of them in the instruction of the young, meaning as we do that our guardians as far as men should be should be true worshippers of the gods and like them. I entirely agree, he said, in these principles and promised to make them my laws. So that was 
Adamantus. Yeah, that's pretty much where it wraps up at the end of chapter two. But yeah, yeah, I think so. It's a good. really interesting. <laughs> on a side <laughs> note, really. I um, on a side note, I heard something and I haven't really double checked it, but I think some of the people he's talking to actually do end up becoming state leaders i think they're amongst the 30 tyrants that come into power later ah, we'll have to double okay. check that for later cool homework all right well um i think that, um, that, that concludes book two are we there that, well, that's the end of the book i i had one or two more thoughts on my go throat for it, yeah oh yeah. me too I, I thought you were calling it so no you no, no let's 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 continue <laughs> well but we've we've actually got to the end of that so let's reflect yeah 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 no, I've, i think just like sort of just still reflecting on the that sort of thought about the the gods being f- fallible or infallible and it's just interesting that they're you know recreating god's image in that sort of text that they're, they're pure and um, would do no wrong and would give us a better moral foundation which to base our society which makes like tons of sense right um but i was just really curious how they would sort of see uh punishment being dealt out um when the, there's like a failure to maintain justice since they say that god can do no evil or harm and the just man can't do any evil or harm either right that was part of their, their sort of previous arguments um and they're sort of implying that you know the evil that gets done in the world is is done by men so not gods and if they want these people to be like gods in the way that they act i'm just curious how they overcome that in order to dispense justice right <laughs> as in and if you're um, a soldier sorry how as do in, you yep continue go well how do you give them the mor- morality when you're saying that you want them to be god godly in the way that they behave but fierce and go uh smash your neighbors to take their land you know what i mean i'm so i'm just curious where the argument's going to go to in the next uh in the next book because i just find it's just an interesting philosophy you're trying to set down here and then but you're saying mm. you're trying to set this philosophy for soldiers so how do you That's draw true. that line he, they even, yeah and they even say oh it's okay to lie to your enemies mm. so they're, they're sort of this sort of almost forecasting this idea that look as long as you're kind to your state or your people it kind of doesn't really matter what you do to the others i mean they haven't gone that mm. far but it's almost like foreshadowing that yeah uh, when you were yeah, saying so that, Lachlan, it... it made me visualize the crusaders <laughs> sure you know there's an example Absolutely. of how it happened holy war the world yeah um yeah. Mm, interesting what was, was that both points Lachlan, or was that one of them uh well i had another one which was just about you know uh you know is a state that has censorship free and is that a just state? Ooh, interesting. That's a whole nother um, show. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Sort of that sort of pre presupposes that freedom is like allowing freedom is a just thing to do. Um, I'm not saying it's not, but that's you just gonna that's almost true. have to start the discussion there. Um, <laughs> How about yeah. you, Ruben? What was, I, but, what was your I, oh, on on what Lachlan was saying just then. Um, the other the other side of that question is well isn't whoever's going to be in charge going to enforce some kind of um sense of justice anyway so i mean whether there is an objective form of it or not like anyway well, actually, um, you're yeah, right. no, you're there's right always going to be someone sort of that pushes some idea is, yeah 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 but justice is just dispensing the laws of whoever's in charge right <laughs> yeah so that balance is coming back. Um, no, but my mm. um, what what my what, what what I found interesting was um, when they were talking about what makes a good soldier and what needs to come out of literature to make a good uh, to train a good a good soldier or good guardian. Um, they're like they they wanted to pull the bits out that would cause them to fear death, and they're like, um, we want men that fear will fear slavery more than death. So they wanted to remove everything that would, would, would lead them to fear death. And what I thought was interesting about that is because it seems like they only had negative um, connotation, like negative 
discussions of the afterlife because they're like there's only one possibility that if you fear death too much then you can't be a good guardian because you're going to compromise so they wanted to remove all of these things that made them fear death but there was no talk of um because there's there's a third option which is well you could make them you could teach them to embrace death which you know you you see that later on with things like val like valhalla for the vikings where a good death will earn you will will earn you Mm. um earn you passage into their version of heaven and to some extent you've got the christian idea too where you could go to hell but you could also go to heaven so there's an incentive to do the right thing i mean not going into theologically and, and and grace and works and all that sort of gear but essentially you've got two ways to look at it but when they're talking about it they're just like we've just got to get rid of anything that talks about death because we don't want them to fear death but they don't think of incentivizing it they just want to remove the fear of it so i thought that was sort of interesting yeah I don't know what that is an interesting is. point it, it you're right like it um like when i mentioned the crusaders before like they 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 were taught that if they go over and fight this battle, that all their sins are paid for and they're and sweet. their families, so right. yeah. yeah, yeah. So they yeah, they ride into stupid situations that everyone else would look at and go, "Why am I going to do this? This is dumb." And half the time, win because <laughs> um, they were fearless because they thought and if they would expect that. Yeah, you know, um, or, you know, it's like a modern day terrorist really is <laughs> someone that's just going in it doesn't matter if they die because they're gonna get the yeah, best reward if they do anyway you know a camera kamikaze pilot yeah no, mm. um so yeah I, I thought that was really interesting and I, I think i think they're right though if you want a good soldier or you want a good guardian you want somebody who um would fear slavery over death um <clears throat> I, I i i did sort of start to wonder if that is extended if that could be extended to just people's mentality within the society um are you would you be in a better society if everyone had that mentality um and i'm just gonna leave that for for people to think about (laughs) well i I think it's it's leading an interesting paradox though because you you you're setting up this high moral and um religiousized army right but it's being built to support this life of luxury and wealth <laughs> that's and right neighbors. by his own admissions the only reason that they're necessary is because people don't just want bread and fish yeah. they want wine and cheese absolutely <laughs> they want it all they want it all and they don't care how they get it and they yeah. want a slave to shuck their oyster you know like i don't know it's uh actually i noticed they didn't they didn't really mention slaves yet have they they've kind of talked about all these different professions and classes they well, haven't they've mentioned all got slaves. slaves remember they they sent the <laughs> yeah. slave on to grab his sleeve at the very start so uh so maybe you know, they'll talk about, about the morality of slavery <laughs> Yeah, they might talk about that later, but so far they've just conveniently <laughs> left that out. One, one step at a time. <laughs> the part yeah, that look, um, I'm, um, I'm oh, sorry, just yeah. really curious to see what happens next because yeah. I, I think, like, sure, there's got to be a plot twist coming up, surely. <laughs> yeah, well, I hope so. Yeah. Um, the part I thought was good uh, was um, where he talks about their education. And there's two divisions gymnastics for the body and music for the soul and then because i'm I've, both both of my kids are learning music uh, musical instruments um and they both do a sport that's a thing every year like you have to do a sport or something to be fit and you have to do music and um so i agree with that uh, but what was interesting was they included within music literature and then talked about like pretend stories but having the goal of teaching good morals yeah, and so um, straight away what came to mind to me then was um the hobbit yeah and and star wars and that sort of stuff and that's that's why those things are important you, when you choose what you let your kids listen to and watch growing up you, you know what stories are they teaching and what morals are they teaching them? even though it's completely not real the truth is in them matter you know yeah um on a on a side mode what what, what i noticed that that bit too was that they're explicitly saying part of education involves teaching character 
um, which I'm not like it's not really something that's explicitly taught. Like we these days they get taught knowledge, like straight reading, writing, arithmetic. But and I guess to some extent we teach children character, but not to the to the like the way he's painting it is that's that's the main point of education is, is teaching character. I, I think I that's wonder, different. I, I wonder if that's a casualty and you know I pre precursor this was saying I I love multiculturalism, <laughs> but I wonder if that's a precursor, like a, a casualty of multiculturalism, is because there's so many different backgrounds and belief systems all getting funneled into one classroom. They've probably just had to focus on the education and not pump the morality so hard because the I, I, different groups I, in that room would have different opinions on what that is. I think more broadly, it's a result of the Enlightenment and um, secular government, but that's a much bigger conversation. It's probably one that I'm not even qualified to have. Well, could both be true at the same time? Oh, yeah, no, certainly. I don't know. Like, it, I, I love uh, I love multicultural food in particular, <laughs> as, as my body attests. Socrates would uh, tell me that I'm overweight, I'm sure. <laughs> That's all good. I don't know. Like, I, I think a lot of that, uh, you know, stuff, it, it does come from those, those sort of, uh, you know, fables and um, it, it seems like that was a part of, and look, in fairness, this is not based on education. It's really based on watching movies, which is a really bad basis to sort of try and like lean on right <laughs> those um, are our stories man <laughs> i know right i know but um i don't know whenever you sort of see stuff around the sort of settings of uh, ancient greece they seem to have this thing about um like sitting the kids down to tell them stories as though like that's their way of doing the classroom right so it's not a classroom in the sort of sense i think that we think of in a in a modern sense um and I think a, a lot of it was sort of, you know, story-based learning. Yeah. So it's just a different different sort of way of, of doing it. But, I mean, it, it's the same, you know, if you tell your kids and, and look, our generation, we're probably not doing this sort of thing, but, you know, Hansel and Gretel or The Boy Who Cried Wolf and all these bedtime stories, for lack of a better word, which have a morality or a, a lesson to be learned from the story. And I think it's just a similar kind of concept that, obviously sort of done in ancient oh and those stories are old as well i mean they're yeah i think they're like thousand years old from europe or what have you and they'll have their own version of those same sort of things you so. just you just reminded me of a time when my son was small i told him the story of the boy who cries wolf but with the traditional ending that uh the boy got eaten <laughs> i i told and the same thing to my kids funnily enough my well, son cried anyway he instantly cried <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i was like oh my gosh Based parenting. Uh, look, I mean, yeah. Look, it's 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 a way of imparting, I suppose, like consequences, right? And trying to tell a story about you know consequence. So I can I can understand mm. that. Maybe um, maybe the thing I was talking about before. Maybe that's a result of a separation of church and state. So maybe it's not a everyone attending the classroom has different beliefs, but that the because the the belief system's been separated from the the state, so to speak, that that's no longer there. That's what I was absence. referring to as, yeah, with secular government. It's one of the yeah, weaknesses okay, of secular okay, okay. government. So do you think um, people who currently go to a religious school would get a different, uh, a stronger compass than you think, like in that sort of sense? It's a good question. Yes, yes and no. I mean, I think yes, but um, it, it depends on the school. And I think uh, even... Um, even religious schools are largely secular now. I mean, Tim and I went to the same private school when we were growing up and there was sort of a semblance of um, Christian teaching, but largely it was the same as um, the secular schools. Mm. I, don't, I don't know what Catholic schools are like, whether they're a bit stronger, but... Yeah, look, it's, it's interesting that... Because uh, I remember when we sort of put the kids into primary school and they sort of asked a question about, like, the religious background because they do have a still a like a religious class once a week or something like that right 
and so they ask what your what your background is and obviously they're trying to you know put people into um into boxes to see the right people who don't send them off to the wrong one um but i think like one of the, the options was if you're a non-religious you got sent to a morality class so it was uh I'm, I'm curious what's in there but a non-religious Me too, yeah uh, yeah morality um class of some description so um the ethics ethics and morality class yeah or yeah like yeah that. yeah hmm. which you, you need in society whether you're religious or not right so uh, yeah, you need course, a code of, of ethics yeah. yeah that's a good observation yeah so that uh yeah that chapter got um once again, in a very short number of pages, covered a lot of ground, didn't it? Mm, mm. That was good. Yeah, well, sure. um, let's take a wander down to the pub for lots of us. <laughs> and um, you're right, I do need to find a jingle for that. Um, no, anyone the listening... Sound, the sound of clinking glasses and, 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 and talking yeah. to people in the background. That's all. I don't have any ice left to... Jingle well, I think so, but I, I feel like it needs some sort of acoustic guitar playing over the top as well. And yeah, yeah, whilst, uh, I own, whilst I own two, I'm not going to record that. So if anyone's listening um, can play Greek music. Um, well, something something like uh, from The Witcher, the, one of Dandelion's song or something. Yes. Um, do that for us. Send it through. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, topic for the pub. I think you guys both had topics ready for this week. Uh, who wants to go first? Oh, mine's 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 pretty uh, pretty vapid. Um, okay, okay. So, oh, uh, Lachlan mentioned the game the other week, um, Art of Rally. Um, yeah. And he mentioned you know the fat '80s synth. So uh, yeah, I plugged that in, and he was right. That game, that game is good. Um, <laughs> but like, it's not just the '80s synth. Like, it's almost. To me, I'm like, it's almost like, because it's a sort of low budget thing and they focus kind of on the art and the music and the driving. I just found myself really enjoying it. And to me, I'm like, this is like really what video games need to be. Because it was almost like, um, to me, it was like an ab- like a, like an abstract painting. You know how you, like yeah. you can have a painting and it, and it can be designed to replicate exactly what... Um, what the painting is of right or you can have something that's abstract um but it's a representation but it can still be really interesting and really beautiful to me that's what this game was just like with with the music and the way that it looked um i just i just found myself just getting lost in it and really enjoying it so oh uh, yeah i i recommend that game really really good it's super pretty visuals for something that's <clears throat> like purposefully like low res what's the game again so yeah Art of uh, rally. rally. Oh, Timmy, they've got the T seventy six in it, but they don't have the license to call it a T. Oh, sorry, what's that? Is it that car that you like, the wedge? The TR seven. TR seven. TR seven. Yeah, and so they they call it a la wedge. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. So that that's um yeah, I hooked into that day and today, and I really found myself enjoying it. So <laughs> very good, Tim. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's a great fun game. Um, it's, I think it's actually got like a surprising amount of um, skill and playability involved to sort of get the most out of it. It's one of those things that you can sink quite a bit of time into, but enjoy it because it looks pretty and it sounds great. It's good fun. Yeah, yeah I really like it too. And it's on Game Pass. So anyone that's got that, has got that, check it out. Mm. Nice. And uh, how about you, Lachlan? Yeah, uh, well, shades of what we were saying before. Rubes is asking me if I uh, had to do the uh, Bunnings run before the um, before you're not allowed to go to Bunnings anymore as of Monday. Um, so, uh, so I did head down there. Cause I, the other week I mentioned that I wanted to build a um, a workbench for my uh, for my garage, and uh, I went down there, but they didn't have the materials I needed, so I was, I was super annoyed. So. Um, Instead, I, uh, I decided to restore a, uh, a coffee table I built 26 years ago. And um, so I bought a few bits and pieces to do that. I thought, you know, surely I must be uh, middle-aged if I'm now restoring things that I built in my youth. <laughs> Something <laughs> requires restoration oh, no. that I originally <laughs> built. So, uh... <laughs> so anyway, I, I got cracking on that today and... Uh, 
took it back apart, been sort of sanding it down, going to stain the, the, the top a different, uh, a different shade and uh, paint the legs up. It's going to look schmick. But uh, anyway, it'll keep, it's going to keep me busy for a little bit. Give me a project. You got your, I can't do the you got your project on. Nice. That's it. That's it. How about um, you, Tim? Oh, I mean, I've just been trying to survive the week. Um, crazy lockdown week that we have. Um, I've, I've, obviously, with all of the restrictions and now curfew and everything else coming through, um, it's just been pretty disheartening. And, um, you know, everyone in the house is tense. Everyone at work is tense. Like, you just feel it. Even doing the shop, you can feel everyone's a bit over it and a bit stressed. And um, yeah. so, I, and, you know, I was overtired through the week too. So I just spent some time reflecting on that. And, um, you know, I found a, a, a quote, um, which is from Seneca, I think. I'll have to check my phone later. Um, where he says, uh, uh, oftentimes we suffer more in imagination than we do in reality. And um, I, th- I thought, oh, yeah, that's that's definitely applicable for right now. I need to actually do a reality check and see, you know, how much of these things impacting me. Um, yeah, what do I still have that's good? What can I be thankful for? Um, so I just started writing down things that I'm thankful for. And um, that that was super helpful. Once I did that for ten minutes, um, yeah, a lot of the sort of anger and frustration starts to evaporate. Um, and uh, I realised I hadn't been journaling for the last week or two because I've been super busy. So um, I've got my journal ready to go, and uh, I'll be using that every day, like I usually do. But I just had stopped over the last few weeks when I probably needed it the most so yeah good on you man I must say like uh, journaling something uh, um, I've always thought it's a really good thing to do and it's something that I never have the discipline to uh, to, to stick to but um, I'll take take my hat to you mate <laughs> good on you I'm not I'm, it's like exercise I'm consistently inconsistent <laughs> <laughs> but I try and do it um, yeah and I've taught I've taught that, my son how to that, do it too. That's really great. I think that thankfulness thing's um, something for everyone as well. You know, like um, it's um, it's a tool to to use to put things in perspective. And I think um, it's something like loads of people will get benefit from if you stop and think about what what you really have to be thankful for. And you know, I think for for most of us, you know, despite what's going on, we've still got a hell of a lot to be thankful for. So. Yeah, I, I I agree with that. Um, set, I like to think of it as setting your default attitude to gratitude. Um, because like, mm. if there's something if there's something that you don't really know how to feel about it, you're like, should I be angry? Should I be upset? It's like, no, no, no. Just set your default attitude to gratitude, and you'll feel better about most things. Good that's way to be. Really, yeah, that's a really good way of talking about it. Default Put it on attitude. a t-shirt, someone. <laughs> default attitude is gratitude it even kind of rhymes yeah I like it <laughs> we've got to fit the word dude in there somehow <laughs> gratitude <laughs> <laughs> gratitude <That's terrible. laughs> well thank you for pending from Socrates <laughs> Socrates <laughs> can we get some like pictures of crates stacked up and like so just put so crits when you do this <laughs> all right well that's that'll that'll uh, conclude uh tonight's show um looking forward to getting into book three over mm. the coming days um so yeah thanks for joining me tonight guys and um to everyone listening uh remember the republic wasn't built in a day and neither were middle-aged men and uh thanks for joining us we'll catch you next time Good night. see you next week Thanks, boys. I'll have Zoom on.